Well hello and uh, welcome to another video. Um, my name is Peter Waters from Waters and Stanton Limited, call sign G3OJV and uh, our company is located at Portsmouth. I did a video about two weeks ago now um, talking about the old days of ham radio and one or two people said could I expand on that so I thought okay well perhaps the best way of expanding on that is to go back to the time when I first became interested in radio. I think I'd always been interested in electronics at school but uh, certainly not, not radio as such and um, I went into a, I was 15 at the time I think, and I went into a news agency in Upminster which was near where I lived and there was a copy of um, Shortwave magazine on the shelf which I took down and uh, had a browse through it and I was fascinated that it was talking about amateur radio and how you could have your own amateur radio station. So I purchased it, took it home and um, I think I must have read it from cover to cover. Uh, it was fascinating really because it's rather like Radcom. Um, in those days it was very much orientated towards transmitting building equipment, um, operating details and there was also a um, monthly uh, page in there called The Other Man's Station and it showed you a photograph of uh, a particular ham radio station and a bit about uh, the equipment they were using and a bit about the guy himself. And I always found that, uh, found that rather fascinating. But anyway, that was my first introduction into ham radio. Now I suppose um, it's a great pity these days that there isn't better coverage of ham radio on the new shelf. I mean, I know there was Pete Practical Wireless is, is published, but it's missing on so many um, bookshelves or news agents and so forth. That there's no magazine that really covers it. Radcom, of course, covers it in great detail, but you have to belong to the RSGB. Now, I can understand why the RSGB don't want to put the magazine on the bookshelf because a lot of people join the RSGB simply to get the magazine. So it's a sort of a catch 22 situation. Anyway, it was a news agent shelf that introduced me into amateur radio. And um, I realised that in order to um, participate, I needed to first of all hear the stations. So back to the news agents again, and I got a copy of Practical Wireless. Now, in that particular magazine, there was um, details of how to build a super regenerative receiver, shortwave receiver. It was two valves. One was the oscillator detector, and I think the other valve must have been the um, amplifier for the headphones. It was quite simple, um, but I'd never built anything before. So I sent off to a, a shop somewhere in London and got the, the components I needed, all the bits and pieces, and I built it on a sort of a, a wooden chassis. Now, I was only 15 at the time, and I needed the assistance of my father, if only, uh, the soldering side because um, I hadn't got a soldering iron. My father had a soldering iron but like a lot of soldering irons in those days they were gas. Now not gas soldering irons as you understand them, it was a soldering iron that needed to be put onto a gas flame, heat it up, then stick it in a, um, a tin of flux and then onto the, sol onto the solder and solder the joint. And of course all the time that the, the soldering iron was not on the gas flame on the gas cooker, it was cooling down, so it was, it was a repetitive process. Anyway, um, I did build the radio and it did work. It was battery operated and I seem to remember that it used um, grid bias batteries. Now, grid bias batteries, um, basically uh, it's, a, it's an elongated battery, fairly large, and it's got a series of sockets. That one socket is labelled zero, I think, and then it goes in, in tapping points 1.53, 4.5, um, 6 volts up to, I think it was 9 volts. And that battery, as I recall, um, provided the HT for the valves, and we HT, and we we're only talking about 9 volts, but these were battery valves, um, and also had to power the heaters. So I, I dread to think how many. Um, batteries that I must have got through. Anyway, it was my introduction into into ham radio. It worked. 
And I remember listening to stations on 40 metres with a, a length of wire down the garden. Of course, it was AM then. And there were CW signals on, but I couldn't understand them because I, I, I didn't know how to read CW. So it was basically listening to AM ham radio signals. But it, it worked quite well. Um, and uh, it was at that point that I decided to join the local amateur radio club in Romford, which is called the Raffars Club. That was the Royal Air, Fo Air Force Amateur Radio Society. Uh, and that was very helpful because it, for the first time it brought me into contact with amateurs. Now I was 16 at the time and uh, I'm not quite sure how I go. I think I walked there actually. It was quite a long walk. It's over a mile um, uh, walk to, 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 to go to the club. But anyway, that was, that was uh, the club I joined. Um, and then I um, purchased a war surplus receiver because as good as the little home-built one was, it was not really, um, certainly not going to be good enough for uh, transmitted purposes. So my father drove me to Gray's Inn Road in London and I bought um, an R107. Now, <laughs> the, the R107 is an enormous, great receiver. It, it weighs about a hundred weight, um, but it does have a built-in AC power supply, which meant to, for, meant to from my point of view, it was it was self-contained, and I've got this receiver home and I connected up to, connected up to the mains, and lo and behold, it worked. It covered the frequency range 1.5 megahertz to 1800 megahertz uh, to 18 megahertz, I think, and um, it had a BFO B frequency oscillator, which meant to say that I could hear AM signals and CW signals, and at that point in time single sideband hadn't really uh, been a force to be reckoned with. Uh, I guess there were one or two stations using it, but I'd never heard of single sideband. It was all AM. And armed with that receiver, then I decided that I must build a transmitter. Um, but in the meantime, I, I, I should explain, I was studying for the RRE. I was then got a job in London, and I was studying on the train, going back to force to London, uh, about an hour's journey and I was reading various uh, um, uh, sort of electronic books and radio books for the RAE. Um, I took the RAE um, at a local um, institute and there was a written examination, it wasn't multi-choice written examination, you had to draw, draw a circuit diagram and answer various questions. I'm not sure how long the exam took, I think it was in two parts, I think it was an hour and a half and an hour and a half with a break. Um, anyway, I passed that exam and my next task then was to go um, to uh, the, the, the post office to take a Morse test. Now, I learned Morse again by um, simply listening to radio stations and, 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 uh, and just to sort of practicing it. I taught myself to, to the letters to recognize them and so forth. It was 12 words a minute. Anyway, I went to this, uh, to this test with the post office um, location in London and I was pleased that I actually passed the test first time, 12 words a minute. So I now had two pieces of paper. I had the RAE pass slip and I had the CW pass slip. So I then went back to a different post office location in London where you could actually go there and um, register and obtain a call sign. Now I always remember this. <laughs> I went into this post, uh, this post um, place, this building, and there was a woman behind the counter and I told her what I wanted and she got an exercise book out from her drawer, put it on the counter and it had a list of call signs that were available and I can choose any one on that page and it was a, a series of G3Os. Why I chose G3O JV I have no idea at all. Maybe I thought it was um, easy for CW, I don't know. Maybe I just like, I don't know what, what it was but anyway, I, I said right that, that's the call sign I want. and. She gave me um, a slip of paper to say that that was my license, and I went. I went back to work in, in the afternoon, home on the train in the evening, and when I got home, I was a radio amateur. I had the call sign G3OJV. I was really chuffed about that. Unfortunately, I didn't have a transmitter, so um, as I say, I, I, I had this um, this idea for transmitter, and. Um, where I got the circuit from, I don't know. I think it may have been practical wireless again. But it comprised two valves again, but this time mains valves, so I had to build a mains power supply. Uh, one was the PA oscillator, 
in other words it was a crystal oscillator and an amplifier in one valve and the other one was the amplifier for the microphone now the popular microphone in those days was the um, carbon carbon microphone the reason for that was it had quite uh, quite a high output so it didn't need that much amplification and uh, I I bought one of these, car of these carbon microphones from a war surplus store um, some while back. Um, built the transmitter, switched it on, and could hear myself in the receiver, which was really good fun. You know, I, I really, I sort of, I, really, I got, I, I actually got my own amateur radio station. Hadn't worked anybody, of course. Um, now, at that time. It was very difficult to know what the power output of the transmitter was. You knew what the power input was because you had a meter to measure the current on the anode and you knew what the voltage was. And you multiply those two together, you got the power, in, what we call the power input in watts. I seem to recall it was about two or three watts, something like that. No idea what the power output was. Very difficult to measure it. In fact, it was impossible to measure it because I had no way of measuring it. Um, what we tended to use then was a neon screwdriver, um, adjusted, adjusted the uh, Pi network output until the, the, the screwdriver glowed, um, build a very simple um, fill strength meter, which was no, no more than a diode and a meter, um, or purchase uh, one of these war surplus thermocouple meters. Now those meters you could put in series with the wire aerial and uh, it would actually show the current flowing in the aerial. The big danger of that was that you had to make sure that the thermo thermocouple meter um, was rated such that you didn't burn it out because it was very easy to burn out. So if, you, if you exceeded the power capability of that thermocouple, you lost your meter. I think it was fair to say in those days, whilst we had a fair idea what our input power was, we really didn't know what the output power was. Probably 50% efficiency was pie in the sky. It's probably more like 30 or 40% efficiency. But anyway, um, it, it worked. It was a way of getting out. Now, the band of operation then um, for, for newcomers tended to be 160 meters because it was easy. There's a lot of people on there. Um, the crystal I had, I think, was 1.92 megahertz. It certainly was a very common crystal because if you had that, bought that crystal, there was a lot of other stations on that frequency. And uh, as I say, 10 watts was a power limitation. Now, I have to say that there are a number of stations whose call signs I won't relate because I can't be sure of uh, the facts, but I'm pretty sure that there was a measure of high power operation on that band. Now when I say high power, we're talking a 10 watt license limitation, and we're talking about stations using war surplus amplifiers with a pair of 813s and something like a two or 3,000 volts on the anodes, probably an input power of about a kilowatt on a band which had a license limitation of 10 watts. <laughs> I think we all knew it was going on, um, and it was the stations that the, the guilty stations had strong signals. You know, you, you couldn't you couldn't ignore the fact they had a strong signal, um, and the excuse often was that, well, I've just put up the new antenna. Um, I think that's why I'm I'm stronger. It was very common in those days to work across the pond to to the states. In the States, they didn't have such a low power limit. I don't know what the power limit was, but it may have been 500 watts anyway. Um, if you worked across to the, the ponds of the States, um, you either had a very good antenna system, uh, you were near the sea with a, a lovely earth system, and quite lucky, or you had a mediocre antenna system. You weren't near the sea, but you were using something like a pair of 813s. <laughs> so that's really how I started my ham radio um, days, my experience in the early days as far as I was concerned. Um, it was, I got my, I started, I was interested in 1959, I got my license in 1960. There's a lot more to tell, but anyway, that's for another time. So I hope you found this interesting. Remember, Waters and Stanton Limited, we're down at Portsmouth. 
Um, we're agents for all the uh, popular ham radio products, Icom, Yesu, uh, Kenwood and so forth, Ellie Craft. If you're looking for gear, please give us a ring. Um, we're staffed by qualified and experienced ham radio op operators and we'd be glad to hear from you. So, until the next time, thanks for watching this video.